Everywhere I go, everywhere I look, there is a deafening tone in the financial world right now. The screams of a previous generation's top investors calling for an imminent financial crash that will bring devastation to markets all around the world. The first example, Michael Burry. The big bear himself, the famed investor from the movie The Big Short who made a whale ton of cash shorting the big crash in 2008. If you check out his Twitter, it's a minefield of warnings about interest rate de defaults, inflation, China contagion, and more. Next, if we head over to Robert Kiyosaki's page, the author of Rich Dad Poor Dad, you can see that one of his most recent tweets is also incredibly bearish. Let me read this out word for word. Giant stock market crash coming October. Why? Treasury and Fed short of T-bills. Gold, silver, Bitcoin may crash too. Cash best for picking up bargains after crash. Not selling gold, silver, Bitcoin, yet have lots of cash for life after stock market crash. Stocks dangerous. Careful. Where are all of these bearish messages coming from? And do they have any basis of truth? Well, let's find out. On the screen right now, I've compiled all of his bearish tweets from the past 10 years. And I've put those on top of the S&P 500 results. Now, if you look at this, you can see that most of the time he's spoken about bearish symbolism or a crash, he has been wrong. But that doesn't necessarily mean he's wrong this time. So we're going to look at all of the claims that him and Michael Burry and others are making and see if they have any grounding in today's world and if we could be at risk of a crash today. Ultimately, as a millennial, I've never seen a proper market crash. The COVID-19 crash lasted all of 10 minutes, so it's hard to imagine that there will be one. And I think that's why we have such a mentality of markets only go up nowadays. But all good things must come to an end. And could that be this year? The first big item on the list is Evergrande, the Chinese property developer that is $305 billion in debt and is failing to make interest repayments. The ultimate fear is that China won't support Evergrande, other property companies will be in similar situations, and we'll basically see a large number of huge property developers unable to make their interest repayments, causing banks and lenders to also go down, causing an Armageddon type situation where the stock market implodes. But let's just take a look at this and see if that's really going to happen. In terms of scale, Evergrande is $305 billion in debt. However, only $7 billion of that is attributed to the US markets. In comparison, in 2008, when Lehman Brothers went down, it was $60 billion in debt. The fear that Evergrande is the first domino in a chain is a very real one. For example, other large property developers in China, like Sunak and Greenland, have combined debt of about $350 billion. If you add that in with Evergrande, that's $650 billion. So in a complete crash, a $650 billion default hitting the market would be pretty devastating. What the media don't often mention is that Evergrande as a company has made some very strange decisions over the past few years. Evergrande was seeking to diversify and they bought a football team, they own a theme park, they started to develop electric vehicles. They're a property development company. These weren't their specialties and they started to lose a lot of money on these as well. And in funding these ventures, they took on a lot of debt, compounding their issues. The point is that Evergrande defaulting on its debt doesn't necessarily mean that the other large property developers will as well. Now, there are cracks in the system. The bond values of these other large property developers have fallen. This implies that people are seeing a risk of default. Housing sales are down 30% from the previous month, according to the property developers themselves. But there's another big kettle in the kitchen, and that's the Chinese government. The Chinese government, for all of its supposed flaws, is one of the most decisive and quickly acting governments in the world, largely in part because of its structure. The US government has to go through layers of approval. They don't have that same issue in the Chinese government. The Chinese government also has every incentive to keep the train on its tracks and to quell any cracks in the system. If the Chinese government don't act decisively, it will be a very surprising move. A second tweet from Michael Burry says that there's been a 94% correlation between the Nasdaq 100 in the 15 years to today and the 15 years to 2000. The S&P 500 shows a 95% correlation. The implication here is that if a pattern has been similar so far, then the pattern is going to be similar going forward. And in 2000, there was a big stock market crash that happened over a couple of years. Michael Burry is saying the patterns are similar, so there's going to be a crash. Now, for me, technical analysis is kind of like astrology. I think you're really pulling at strings, and I don't think charts tell you too much. Ultimately, quantitative and qualitative factors of the economic system and stocks at the time 
I think that's the best way to tell what the stock market's going to do going forward. And I think Michael Burry would agree. To me, this tweet reads like he's really trying to sell the idea of a crash to the general public and to his followers. But what if Burry wasn't dabbling in the mystic arts of pattern reading, and was instead making the salient point that the current market conditions could be similar to the market conditions in 2000, where the market was overpriced just before the dot-com crash? In which case a good place to start might be to look at the price to earnings ratio of the market over the last 30 years. Loading this up you can see that the market was valued much more highly in 2000 and 2008 than it is today. And on top of that we would expect the market to be worth more today. Low interest rates drive up the stock market valuation as the dividends are worth more. Cash is trash, banks can't pay out. So we value those dividends even more than usual so we're willing to pay more for stocks. And so for this reason, the market doesn't seem too overvalued for me. And this is actually supported by Michael Burry himself, the big bear. Michael Burry's invested into a number of stocks, for example, Facebook. He has calls in big tech companies. In fact, he's only shorting segments of the market such as Tesla and other highly valued stocks. Analysts often forget that people are so much better educated today than they were 20 years ago. That includes both the general public and governments. Governments know exactly how to deal with bad situations. They went through 2008, they went through 2000. They know exactly what works and what doesn't. The general public have the wealth of information that the internet has given them. They know that the stock market generally goes up. They know that all dips so far have been temporary and that over a 20 year period, people have always made a return. The wealth of information that the internet has provided has reduced the capability for crashes. People will hold during a dip instead of panic selling because they know the data supports them. Many people will in fact invest when the markets are low, bringing the market back up to its usual level. They'll be buying at a discount and know they'll get great returns, just as people did in 2008 and the COVID-19 crash. A big sudden crash seems unlikely. A far more likely scenario would be a slow and steady crash, month after month beating people down as the markets seem under overvalued. To me, the most likely situation, if anything, would be stagnation. When dips occur, people buy them and that brings the market back up to the mean. It's just built into the psychology of the current generation. I think it's going to require truly dire market conditions for the market to truly crash and stay there. Even a broken clock is right two times a day, and many of these people permanently calling for a crash have a worse record than a broken clock. You may have noticed that I've really addressed Michael Bowie's points, but I haven't really addressed Robert Kiyosaki's point that there's a shortage of treasury bills and that's going to cause a stock market crash in October. The reason for this is that after searching for an hour, I found no evidence that there is a shortage of treasury bills full stop, let alone that it's going to cause a market crash in October. In fact, the only evidence I found is Robert Kiyosaki's tweet itself. So what I would say to Robert is, back it up. What's your evidence? Provide some support and then we'll happily take it seriously and consider if a market crash is coming and we should withdraw our money almost immediately because it's going to happen in the next 30 days. A final point I would say, and quite a poignant tweet from Michael Bowie, is as follows. In 1929, 1973, 2000 and 2008, a better short than any company was the guy who would be buying all the way down. Buying the dip and dollar cost averaging is the best way to maximize your returns. That's from the big bear himself, Michael Bowie. And as you can tell, he loves patterns. So if that worked in the past, it will still work today. Well done on watching this all the way through. If you could hit that like button and subscribe, that would be fantastic. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments and let's beat the market together.